Um, now, um, boy, it's hard to stay on time, but we are doing it. I would like to ask um, Christina Cole, Sabrina Merlo, and um, Victoria Jacqua to um, join me. And I want to make, I need to make sure I've made them all co host here very quickly. Oh, no, almost hit the wrong button. Okay, so I believe you are all uh, co host here. Now, um, uh, these are three of my favorite people. Open Source Medical Supplies um, did something that the teams that I mostly worked on didn't, which is they were successful during the pandemic in, in delivering an awful lot of life-saving equipment. Now, granted, some of that equipment in the form of personal protective equipment was easier to build than oxygen concentrators and ventilators, and so there's a good reason for that. But nonetheless, I would like to see what OSMS did be slowly expanded over time to more sophisticated devices. And I think we have a lot to learn from them. Um, I, I know a little bit about all three of these ladies, but I'm not gonna try to introduce them. I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, so um, let me just remind everybody a few things before, before we do that. Um, I would like to... Um, uh, thank everybody for being here, uh, both our speakers and the people who have attended. I apologize for the event bright screw up. That was my fault. Um, and also, please, after this conference, we are getting to the end here. Um, at the end of this, we're going to have um, Maria Elena uh, Botazzi talk about her vaccine development, which is really uh, a, a significant thing. She's just going to briefly talk before we go into the live um, showcase please, you're allowed to hang out in rehive permanently. So you, if, if you want to, you can talk, drink beer, whatever, for three hours in the rehive after the webinar is over. Okay, so ladies, um, please begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for that introduction. And, and thank you, everyone that's here with us today. I'm actually going to start us off. I'm Christina Cole, Head of Documentation at Open Source Medical Supplies. I'm joined today by with Sabrina Merlo and Victoria Jacqua, uh, who will also be presenting. I'm going to do a screen share so that I can share our presentation deck with everyone. So bear with me for one moment while I kick that off. Excellent, and that's not the beginning. Apologies. There we go. All right, uh, can everyone see this? We're good. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization or we haven't uh, presented to you in a while or just have been out of the loop. Open Source Medical Supplies was launched in March of 2020. Um, we quickly fostered a global network of over 74,000 makers, fabricators, community organizers, and medical professionals, all of whom were working to alleviate the critical shortages of medical supplies globally, specifically early, and especially early in the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have four key elements to our organization. Uh, the first and one that a lot of the Baker community are familiar with is our project library. And this is a searchable repository of designs that have been curated, collected, information has been extracted from these and they've been put into our library. It's searchable um, through a tagging system. You can search by materials, you can search by skills, the tools that you have. Um, and this was, was and continues to be something that we are expanding and has been uh, a popular feature of open source medical supplies. Uh, currently we have more than 2000 projects that you can find in our library that span 30 different types of health supplies. And these range from basic PPE, such as a face shield, different types of face masks, all the way up to non-invasive helmet ventilation and some more complex devices as well. Moving on, we have our engaged community. Um, our Facebook group has served as kind of our open source design ideation we have currently 60,000 members. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we did have more, 
uh, still active though. And this is where folks come to post their projects, their designs. We have people that come to post a need. Uh, early in the pandemic, we would get healthcare workers that would reach out through this group asking for uh, resources, supplies, or to be connected to these makers. And we've really seen a lot of innovation and discussion here. Of course, we do have a Slack channel, which was again, very active early on, but most of this kind of happens visually in our Facebook community. Uh, we do also offer guidance and we've produced several guides at this point, uh, easy to follow guides that compile official guidelines and guidance and also research and at times interviews. And these are distilled into reader friendly formats. So uh, lay person accessible terminology, which is important uh, in the pandemic when it comes to, uh, you know, public response or public health information is make sure that it's easy for folks to understand, especially when it's pertaining to a medical situation or healthcare where there can be a lot of complex terminology and jargon. So we've really spent a lot of time on these. Um, and this is something that we you know, also have additional upcoming guides in the works. And then thought leadership. Um, it's not just OSMS out there, you know, we have created coalitions, we've partnered on calls to actions and reports. And the report that I have pictured here was actually our design make protect report. Um, this report, we began taking, we began conducting tallies from our Facebook group weekly, um, asking maker communities and makers how much of how much PPE or products were you producing every week? We actually started this at the start of our group in March, 2020 to capture the bottom up response. But by the end of 2020, um, we partnered with Nation of Makers to produce a report summarizing the pandemic response efforts uh, with data collected from our weekly tallies. We sent out an impact survey um, which is, you can see on this slide here, it was a sample from it. So there's our weekly tally, our impact survey. And additionally, um, you know, partnered with, uh, excuse me, we combined with the data set uh, from a survey that FAB Foundation sent to the FAB Lab, Lab Network. So our Design Make Protect report is really a qualitative narrative of a combination of these tallies and surveys um, interviews with individuals from within the citizen maker response. And really the findings of this report demonstrate the efficacy and timeliness of this hyper-local response combined with the distribution of easily accessible open source solutions through a global network. And this is just a snapshot from our from our paper that we put out. Um, you can see you know, just some, some numbers there, 42,000 plus citizen responders, 93% of whom were volunteers, and 48.3 plus million units of medical supplies delivered, all from the maker community, open source, uh, these open source designs. And when we looked at where these items came from or who the responders were, uh, it was significantly retooled manufacturers, small scale manufacturers, but also maker spaces or fab labs. Um, and in there, of course, you have distributed online groups and universities and colleges. So this really captures um, not just what was made and by whom, really the scope of this movement. And with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Victoria. Hi everyone, I am Victoria Jacqua. I am the medical community lead for OSMS. I'm a board member at Public Invention and I work full time in the clinical field. Um, I'm an imaging technologist in uh, cardiac emergency procedures. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, success points of the OSMS response and dive into the psychology of that because um, I also in my spare time uh, I'm heavily involved in the somatic and neuroscience uh, research world. So when OSMS had been in uh, operation for a few weeks, we ran across an interview that Dr. Michael Ryan of the WHO did, where he bullet pointed the ideal response to pandemic management. 
be first, be fast, be coordinated and coherent, be prepared, use the resources you already have. Don't wait to be perfect, engage the community. And the greatest error is not to move. By the time we saw this interview, we were already in full swing and we were astonishingly hitting every single bullet point that Dr. Ryan um, mentioned in his statement. So I wanna talk about being prepared and the, the success points uh, that developed from that. We were the first group to formally mobilize PPE production. And by April, 2020, we had trap production of 2.3 million units of product. Uh, we coordinated international network. We motivated resources already in place. As Christina mentioned, we had maker spaces, independent fabricators and small, man small scale manufacturing all working together. Um, we did not wait for federal regulatory approval. We did not wait to be perfect. We engaged an international community and we kept moving constantly, adjusting and responding to the rapid shifts in supply and demand. So the, the big foundation of this response was that we were surprisingly prepared. We had a pre-existing network of places to make things, whether it was a makerspace, a fab lab, or pre-existing university medical school collaborations. And these networks quickly started working together and they connected with uh, scaled manufacturing, whether it was local or regional. And from this network um, evolved a lot of documentation and design. And because of the power of the internet, uh, best practices were shared internationally. And this allowed communities to respond at progressive stages. So in individual situations, they could respond at step four or five or 10, instead of constantly having to rebuild the wheel and begin at step one. And this is a critical um, asset of open source is that you can share quickly and you can save time because you're sharing best practices and there's a lot of collaboration going on. So, Next slide, Christina. Today, while we're still going through the pandemic, we are actively creating the resources we already have. We, main, we have to maintain our current networks and we have to foster the production of new credible systems. All of these resource communities help the speed, preparation, coherence, local engagement, and the quick action continue for the crisis is of today and tomorrow. If you are here now, you are part of this resource. So once again, open source allows people to collaborate and I feel go further together. If you read in our report, there's some really strong examples of this. The DTM face shield in March, 2020 was created by the Prusa Maker Network in Czechoslovakia. It was quickly brought to the Czechoslovakian Ministry of Health and through the power of the internet, the University of Washington uh, VA medical system got hold of the design, clinically tested it, railroaded it to the NIH and approval for clinical use occurred in days and not months. The M 1902 was uh, an oxygen concentrator built by uh, partners, uh, OSMS partner M19 in India. OSMS uh, released an oxygen report in October of 2020. One of our, what, we were one of the first organizations to alert the international community to the dire need of oxygenation that was gonna be happening. So M19 developed um, their open source oxygen concentrator, which is currently in testing, uh, technical testing in April, 2021, but they leaned heavily on designs and documentation from previous organizations. Uh, RepRap um, out of England was one of the first oxygen concentrator designs on GitHub. So they pulled best practices and, and design from all these different uh, documentation sets that evolved into the M1902. And we're currently um, working with new systems 
created from existing resources. Oxygen Alliance, who's presenting today, is a really good example. Um, and M19 Repair Cafe is also working in a very similar field. Um, all these teams are working on a similar project, repairing, maintaining old previously failing oxygen concentrators and even reverse engineering parts that are no longer available on the commercial market. The M19 Repair Cafe repair cafes started in India, but they have had uh, collaborations in Tanzania for this same project. So if you um, have these foundational resources, you can then create new local systems. And these new local systems create infrastructure. And through the power of open source, you share credible information and that has no border. So I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of crisis response, because I think it's very critical in how we reframe our emergency response through top-down organizations and manage grassroots response as well. So when we as humans go through a uh, emergent event, we can have a, a fight or flight freeze reaction. This is a biological reaction. Most people know about that. And the way that we heal and recover from that initial shock of emergency depends on how much access to resources we have. A well resourced person is going to recover sooner and maintain resources if they have, they'll do that better than it, uh, compared to a poorly resourced person. So, resource availability is important for healing. So in a community emergency response, that response will fall along a distribution. Some people are going to be scared and not move. Other people will be well-resourced well, well resourced and they'll move faster. They'll be able to pivot in response. So if you have a collective of well-resourced individuals, they will become resilient. And there's so much focus nowadays on, you know, being resilient, being resilient. And in reality, in order to create resilience, you have to provide people resources. And that can simply mean knowing where those resources are, how to access them, and how to communicate ongoing needs. When you resource someone, you help them create infrastructure. And a robust infrastructure allows pivotal timely emergency response. And this was very important for the start of OSMS because we had a critical window of time that we paid attention to. In the early stages, people are motivated to help when they believe a co collective solution is possible. And this window is full of potential energy waiting for kinetic conversion by leadership. We recognized this critical window and we harnessed it and we became a resource for an international community experiencing a traumatic emergent event. Now remember, when all of this started in spring of 2020, there were no previously recorded open source PPE designs. So we worked with a constantly moving target. Now, back then it was very difficult to create a new response system from new resources while actively experiencing an emergent event. People in the OSMS leadership, in the medical community, you're actively dealing with family members getting sick, you're getting sick, and you're trying to run an emergency response. It's very, very difficult. An additional trauma is waiting for top-down authorities to acknowledge there even is an emergency, which wastes valuable response time and extends the trauma experience. So if we're gonna be prepared for these current crises and beyond, we have to be prepared to rethink how we respond to these and we invest in local infrastructure because you cannot effectively operate in constant crisis mode. You have to build foundations. And a key part of this is gonna be de decolonialization. There's definitely strong uh, movements over the past few years towards empowering our LMICs and marginalized people with goals to reduce external dependency, encourage self-reliance and abolish racism. However, the resultant um, actions can be resource removal or bootstrapping, where you know you got to take care of yourselves and be resilient. Um, conditional resourcing: I'm only going to do this for you if you do this for me. Uh, shaming people for being poorly resourced, rescuing 
dumping supplies that are not needed, and performative speech that doesn't really accept, um, address the problem. So we really need to focus on supporting the people who are doing the work in the field. Community response teams, similar to uh, the team in Malawi who are setting up biomed teams that fix uh, equipment, uh, nodal infrastructure, hyperlocal, region-specific designs. This is important for um, the oxygen concentrators who uh, the oxygen concentrators that were delivered by international agencies, and then they don't work in a uh, tropical environment due to humidity. The M1902 evolved from that. It is a region specific design where the zeolite can uh, operate under a humid condition. Provide appropriate external resources, don't just send whatever. And a really, really important need for open source layperson public health standards, cleaning the air, promoting air movement, and PEP construction and use and quality metrics. This would, be, would have been very valuable for El Salvador in the spring of 2020. They received so much imported PPE that was poor quality, and they had no metrics to test it. They had, they had no idea how to test this PPE and see if, if it was actually protective. So key points, we can't expect one organization to do it all. We have to define and streamline collaborations. If we do more work outside a hospital, meaning engaging the community, doing preventative measures, it relieves the stress on clinical staff. We need to start engaging our non-clinical brain power to relieve the stress on our clinical staff. And local already in place structures will respond faster than external resourcing and we have to support community building. Time is life. Establishing local resources saves time, which ultimately saves lives. I guess this is my turn. I'm Sabrina Merlo. I am the head of local response at Open Source Medical Supplies or or was during the, the, the primary um, crisis point of 2021 and leading into 20, or 2020, beginning in 2021. Um, as a response to the experience, um, engaging in the open source response to the supply chain breakdown, I uh, applied to become a fellow at the day one project, a policy, a science and technology policy incubator. It's a fellowship program um, that, is um, bipartisan, but is tied to the Biden administration in the back end, and uh, wrote up my sort of a researched response to how we might think about moving forward um, to leverage the open source networks on behalf of uh, supply chain resilience um, and national security. And this policy is called Building Medical Supply Chain Resilience Through US Manufacturing Reserve and Digital Stockpile. It's um, I'm just going to get into all of the all of the details on that paper, but um, the link is there, osms.li slash day one. Um, and as Laith referred to, we did a broader policy uh, approach for ways to move forward in the design make protect report. Go ahead, Christina. I mean, the idea was how do you how do you formalize these networks that perform so well and better integrate them into uh, regulatory and funding streams. Everyone did this outside of government. Are there ways to integrate um, more post-emergency outcomes? We founded a new policy working group with the Nation of Makers trying to make the case for um, these unusual suppliers in terms of uh, and designers for emergency response and community resilience, education, workforce development, and economic development. Um, that website is up at nationofmakers.us slash making the case. Um, again, thinking about what are, the, what are the existing infrastructure that support um, the open source networks? And one of them is makerspaces. That's a tangible um, outcome uh, and meeting ground um, for hard open source hardware enthusiasts. And how can we support those make, the makerspace ecosystem, um, invest in that very real ecosystem to um, to build national supply chain resilience. Um, also looking at other sort of like broader maker policy strategies 
you know, the right to repair scene is incredibly evolved in the US and internationally. They're very organized. They have bills pending in multiple states. Um, uh, it, it's something to investigate, um, especially for the biomedical engineers out there um, who experience and were under such stranglehold trying to repair machines in hospitals during the emergency. Um, the FDA, we had, a, we had a, a, a staff person on the FDA in, the, in this conversation earlier. Um, you know, there's a community collaborative, uh, collaborative community mechanism at the FDA. Is that a good idea for the open source um, medical supply um, designers and engineers to actually develop a formal collaborative community with the FDA? Next slide. Um, there's just just introduced last week, the Supply Chain Resiliency Act. It establishes a new Office of Supply Chain Resiliency within the Department of Commerce. You know, where are the open source and maker approaches in that act? That has yet to be determined, but that's a, a, an opportunity for investment. Um, US Digital Stockpile, this thing came out um, in last year from the America Makes National Center for Defense Manufacturing and Machining. Um, you know, but it's only about additive. That's not a that's not a solution for our um, for a full emergency response. It can't be about one one sort of manufacturing approach. I mean, the challenges are it's a vast um, it's a vast and intricate policy dance out there. Um, it's really about building relationships, um, tracking legislative opportunities but also sort of opportunities across um, administration and staff. Um, but even when stuff gets passed, like the recent um, CHIPS Act and, and massive piles of funding and Build Back Better, where and when are, are the fiscal allocations, where do they show up locally where maker spaces and maker infrastructure um, can access them? So here are more opportunities that have, um, come through recently. How can they serve makerspace and open source networks? So some of the approaches, I mean, it's, it's, it's very large. Go ahead, new slide. Um, this policy working group is just trying to start from the beginning. How can we fund a maker uh, congressional fellow in Congress to track and help propose maker uh, legislation? How do we establish um, a policy fellowship for makerspace leadership so that we could actually document and share best practices across makerspace leaderships, uh, you know, for how to how are they are discovering the support and monies um, and produce a nationwide Hill Day, which is a pretty standard um, practice for, um, you know, associations to go and do uh, to have clarified asks and talking points to talk to their representatives. So if you're interested, um, very, uh, available for conversation, I guess, over in the next, in our, in the platform. What's our platform again, Robert? Rehive. Rehive. Yeah. We can um, head over there. So uh, I'd like to summarize this. Uh, there are a lot of questions that could be asked here. We need to find a way to make testing fun. You know, right, right now, it, it's not, as, a, as an academic, it's more fun to write papers about the front end of the process, about the development process, than to write papers about testing. But you guys have pointed out, like every person who's spoken, that testing is critical uh, to doing this. And I, I, think, I think we can achieve that. Um, and also, you know, it's important to understand this was a success. Lives were saved. I worked for two years on a ventilator it's, it hasn't saved any lives. I'm not even sure the rice ventilator saved any lives. Maybe their neonatal CPAP machine did, but their, their ventilator, as far as I know, has not actually been used. But what OSMS did, did save lives. And I think we can build on that foundation. Um, also, as I pointed out, um, almost no one in this effort gets paid. Um, everybody here is a volunteer. Um, public invention doesn't really pay anybody, but we do sometimes give out these nice little plaques. And I have one here for Christina Cole uh, for um, the most impactful writing presented to Christina Cole for the oxygen concentrator maintenance 2021, which uh, eventually I will ship to her. Um, Thank you, Rob. Uh, she wrote, and I have it 
if I, I have a link to it here, this is part of what OSMS did, but public invention sort of helped with it. Uh, here's a link to what you can see. She wrote a document on how to maintain and repair oxygen concentrators. 